Chapter 9 of The Submarine Boys for the Flag. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Dickerman, Claremont, New Hampshire. The Submarine Boys for the Flag by Victor G. Durham. Jack Plays with a Volcano. After something more than an hour's drive, the Jehu pulled his horses up, got down from the box, and opened one of the doors. Here you are, gents. This is the spot where I put the last fare down. And now you know as much about her whereabouts as I do. The district into which the submarine boys had come was well outside the city, and in a different direction from Craven's Bay and the fort. It was bleak and wild here. Even the shanties of the three little villages, with their fish sheds, their racks with nets spread, the rickety wharves, all looked dismal. It seemed as though here must be one of the spots where only a scanty living is earned, and only by the hardest kind of work. Well, we're much obliged to you, driver, and here's the money promised to you. Obliged to you, gents. Will you want to be going back with me? No, Captain Jack answered. I reckon we're going to be moored here for a while. Now, where away? What's the course? demanded F. Summers. Benson glanced at his watch, then up at the sun. It'll be dark in about an hour and a half, he muttered. Why not wait until dark? We can't have been seen from any of the villages yet. Looking out over the water, you don't see a craft of any sort headed away from here. From this point, looking down, we can see if any of the boats in port get ready to put out. So Millard, if he hasn't already escaped, can't get away by sea without our knowing it. If he tries to get away by land, we're right where we can see him coming. Then you think we'd better wait here, keeping out of sight until dark, asked Hal? Most decidedly, don't you? Yes, nodded Hal. But it'll be a mighty tedious wait, growled F, the impatient one. Well, youngster, we're not here to consult our own comfort, retorted Captain Jack. There's something higher to consult, the best interests of our country. Oh, if you put it that way, grumbled F, much mollified. The submarine boys had stepped into a little hollow just off the road and barely below a rise in the ground. There were trees and bushes about to aid them in concealing themselves. If they saw anyone coming their way, they could easily find better hiding. No one came, however. Dark found the boys desperately hungry. Of course we didn't think to bring anything to eat, uttered F, disgustedly. What are we going to do about it? We've got to each of us take a village, presently, enter it, and search, replied Captain Jack. With only one of us to each village, it will be tough luck if each one can't find someone who has enough food to sell a little of it. How soon are we going to start? asked F, hopefully. Well, supper time will be the best time to go through the villages, decided the young submarine skipper. If Millard has taken refuge with anyone who lives in one of these villages, he'll be more likely to show himself at supper time than at any other. It won't take long to look into each of the houses, muttered Hal. There aren't many in any one of the villages. If we don't espy our man at table, Captain Jack went on, we'll have to try other means of finding him out. You two will know what to do when you're on the ground. If Millard is anywhere in the village that you go to look through, don't fail to find him, that's all. Jack chose for himself the northernmost village. Hal took the next one, and F the southernmost. Now remember, fellows, breathed Benson sharply, as they parted, the one great thing is not to fail. The night was dark and the sky overcast as the submarine boys parted to go their several ways. I think I can understand how F feels about his stomach, grimaced Jack as he strode along. I don't believe I'd balk just now at the plainest food ever cooked. Why, I haven't eaten since this morning. 
the evening being rather warm most of the houses as jack neared the village proved to have open windows lights shone and the fishermen and their families could be seen at table no one appeared in the street at first jack strolled down the principal street looking into each house without much difficulty yet the one face that he sought was not visible down at the further end of the street benson came upon a tumble-down looking grocery store what kind of sandwiches can you put me up queried the submarine boy casually stranger eh asked the man behind the counter staring curiously yes haven't you had any strangers here lately not as i knows on replied the man a shaggy unkempt looking fellow of forty none here to-day eh asked jack taking out a half dollar and toying with it on the counter don't remember anybody very special replied the storekeeper you haven't answered me about the kinds of sandwiches you can put up jack reminded him not very fancy in that line young feller cheese or sardines that's all give me three of each then begged jack he seized the first sandwich that was prepared and began to eat it hungry eh asked the storekeeper yes jack admitted for want of anything better to do follow the sea don't you depends muttered jack his mouth half full of sandwich when i'm going before a brisk fair wind sometimes the sea follows me suppose so grinned the storekeeper passing over the second sandwich after that the fellow got in slightly ahead of the submarine boy's appetite though benson finished the whole meal in a few minutes now if you've got a bottle of soda water to wash that all down with hinted benson it was forthcoming also a smoky-looking glass so you haven't had any strangers here lately hinted captain jack nope any craft being fitted out to sail to-night or first thing in the morning nope gracious but this is a dead place laughed jack must be a lot of shacks for rent around here there was one place stated the storekeeper but a dude feller hired it last week said some sort of fishing club be down this way to fish once in a while that kind of minds me went on the storekeeper i guess maybe some of that crowd are down cause i saw a light up there at the house just come dark if there's a fishing club down here that ought to make business good for you suggested captain jack dunno they can start trading as soon as they like i'm ready which house has the fishing club hired was jack's next question why i guess you can make it out from the door replied the storekeeper coming out from behind the counter and going to the front of his establishment there if your eyes are good you can just make out a building over there on the point see it well there's a little boat wharf in front that you can't see until you get closer jack had found out just what he wanted to know he had the very information for which he had been fishing nor did he believe the storekeeper suspected him of undue curiosity well i've got to be moving along now i'm fed announced young benson the yacht i belong to is some distance from here good night nor did captain jack linger in the village had any one stood still in that street and stared after benson he would have seen the boy vanish in the darkness captain jack however had not disappeared from the scene he was merely shifting to the part of it that interested him most cautiously he stole out along the further side of a ridge of land toward the rickety old house on the point not a sign of a light now breathed the submarine boy if millard was really there i hope he hasn't had time to get away for good all was silent and dark about the old house as captain jack stole closer at nearer range he made the circuit of the house only to find every window shuttered and the place as dismal as the grave i'm afraid the game has escaped muttered benson with a sinking feeling at his heart yet he didn't escape by sea or land while we were watching outside the village and it was just at dark that the storekeeper saw a light here i wonder if it would be easy to right there jack benson's train of thought broke off 
From the opposite side of the house came a sound exactly like that of the opening and closing of a door. "'Can that be our man coming out?' wondered Skipper Jack. He started cautiously around the house, but soon drew back around the corner of the building. Dropping to the ground and lying flat, the submarine boy allowed only the top of his head to show as he peeped. Glory! Jack knew well enough that tall figure striding off into the gloom. It was Millard, and under his left arm the fellow carried a large package that might be a bulky portfolio well wrapped. He has his drawings, his maps of American fortifications and fortified harbors, the very stuff that we want to get, throbbed the boy. And now we're going to get them. Keeping Millard's receding figure zealously in sight, Jack, crouching low, started after the long-legged one as soon as the distance between seemed sufficient to keep Millard from guessing at pursuit. "'Oh, how I wish Hal and F. were here,' muttered Captain Jack, in keen disappointment. "'I need help on this.' Within two minutes Millard had struck into a well-beaten path that led northward over succeeding ridges of Lod. In a way it was easier following here, for there were occasional trees and clumps of bushes behind which the young shadow could drop at need. Two minutes in this path, and Jack Benson's heart gave another quick leap. Someone else was coming stealthily behind him. Jack dodged around a clump of bushes and waited. Hal, breathed Jack, almost wild with joy, as the two chums clasped hands fervently for one brief instant. Then, see here, Hal, I've got to dart forward again, or Millard will be out of sight. But I'll tell you what. While I trail Millard, you concern yourself only with following me. Good enough, whispered Hastings, nodding. Now, you start again. For just an instant, Millard had disappeared. However, by moving forward quickly, Benson was soon able to make out the quarry through the darkness. For some five minutes more, the chase continued. Then, his long body rather sharply defined against the sky, Millard began the ascent of a low hill that ended in a cliff overlooking the broad ocean. As Millard's course forward could end only in the sea, Jack now crouched low, stealing along a parallel course behind a low ridge of rock. Then Millard suddenly stepped into a clump of tall bushes. Though his game was now out of sight, Jack did not lose his nerve, for he could hear the fellow. Spink, spank, clank, the noise came from a shovel, vigorously used. Not a hard one to guess, throbbed Captain Jack Benson exultantly. He has brought his maps and his stolen records with him, and is burying them in this lonely spot until some other time when he feels safe about coming back for them. Talk about luck! Why, Hal and I can pounce on this fellow when he comes out over yonder, and after we get him... We can next dig up whatever it is that this foreign agent thinks is worth burying. Then, with a shade of curiosity, Benson added to himself, I don't know yet how it happened that Hal was on my trail. There wasn't time for him to tell me. Clank, clank. But after a while, the noise of the shovel ceased for a while. Captain Jack craned his neck eagerly, trying to pierce the darkness of the night. He could make out nothing, though he heard someone still moving inside the clump of bushes. Then again the noise of the shovel on the dirt was heard. He's filling in now, beyond a doubt, thought Captain Jack. He is burying, what, the maps and records? Hiding them here, that he may dig them up at some later date? Benson chuckled noiselessly. If that's Millard's game... I reckon someone else will do some digging over yonder before he pays this place a second visit. Ah, the noise had stopped, at last. Now, Millard came out of the thicket. He hasn't that bundle he brought up here, throbbed Jack Benson. And he isn't bringing a shovel out either. So it must be hidden right handy. Great! Mr. Millard could depart now if he wanted. Jack trusted to his chum, prowling somewhere about, to have the good judgment to follow the long-legged fellow away. 
As for Benson, he didn't mean to do another thing until he had found the shovel and had determined just what had been so carefully buried on this dark night. So Jack watched, rather indifferently, as Millard slunk off into the darkness. After three minutes or so had passed, Jack rose and ran straight for the thicket. There it was, new ground, that had just been turned over with a shovel. There was no mound, but the fresh earth showed just where to dig. Oh, this is as easy as making change for a blind man, chuckled the young submarine skipper, rubbing his hands ecstatically. What about the shovel? Jack turned to feel around in the darkness. Really, Millard couldn't be such a very clever fellow. Jack had no difficulty in finding the shovel. Its handle was sticking out from under a mass of dead brush. Jack Benson drew out the implement, brandishing it. Hal had the good sense to shadow that chap away, decided the young skipper. Otherwise, he'd have been here by this time. Good haul, rascal and records in the same night. For if Hal goes on Millard's trail, then Millard is pretty sure to be a prisoner before the night is over. Oh, I wish F would turn up. Then Jack took a good grip on the shovel. Clank, spink, spink. Having been so recently moved, this dirt was easy to dig. Yet suddenly, there came a new note on the night air. Jack, oh Jack, sounded in Hal's frantic tones. Quick! Eh? called Captain Benson. What's the row? Come here and see what I can show you. No, you come here, quick! That's queer, pondered Jack Benson, leaning on his shovel, trying to understand what it could all mean. Then he heard, even at the distance, the sound of Hal Hastings panting, as though engaged in hard physical effort. Again rose Hastings' frantic voice, though somewhat muffled in its sound. If you don't hustle, it will be too late. Jack dropped the shovel on the ground, wheeled, and ran down the slope to where Hal's voice sounded. I'm coming, old fellow, quivered the submarine skipper, starting to run. Boom! A terrific explosion shook the ground. The air seemed full of flying fragments of rock. End of Jack Plays with a Volcano Chapter 10 of The Submarine Boys for the Flag This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Dickerman, Claremont, New Hampshire. The Submarine Boys for the Flag by Victor G. Durham. Mr. Gray Makes New Trouble. Had Jack Benson started down the slope two or three seconds later, he must have been killed. As it was, the fearful force of concussion sent him sprawling headlong on the ground. A shower of small fragments of rock and of loose dirt fell about him. Yet Jack was up again, like a flash, never stopping to inquire whether he had been hurt. Uh-oh, came the groan from Hal Hastings. There, in a second, panted Captain Jack, beginning to run again. A blow sounded, then a fall. Captain Jack raced into a little bush-lined hollow just in time to see Millard leap up and take to his heels. Hal Hastings lay on the ground as though badly hurt. Oh, you would, would you, raged Captain Jack, making a swift spurt after Millard. He caught the long-legged one, too, by the back of the fellow's coat collar. Yank! Millard was pulled over backward. Down he went. Benson piling atop of him. Down, cried Skipper Jack exultantly. He found, however, that Millard possessed strength enough to put up a stiff fight. Come on, Hal, if you can, called Jack Benson sharply. Can't, just yet, came in muffled tones from the usually prompt Hal Hastings. Let go, you young hound, ordered Millard, striking out savagely. Jack hung desperately. Yet the trouble was that the young submarine skipper had tackled a man who was at least fifty per cent stronger and fully as agile. While Hal still hung back, Millard gave a heave 
then rolled himself over on top of Jack Benson. "'I'll give you just a short lesson,' snarled the long-legged one. He raised a fist, intent on bringing it down like a sledgehammer across Benson's face. That blow, however, wasn't the one that landed. Biff! Whack! Two sturdy hard fists registered on Millard's head from behind. Then a boy shot himself forward, battering ram fashion, hurling Millard over to the ground. The boy went with the fellow, landing on top of him. And that boy was F. Summers. Come on, Jack, if you want some of this, offered F. generously. Truth to tell, there was need of both the submarine boys, for Millard now fought more fiendishly than before. Millard was a powerful fellow, when aroused, but he had pitted against him two of the dowdiest, gamest boys to be found along the Atlantic coast. He was pretty well beaten up, in fact, by the time that Hal came limply upon the scene. "'Want any help?' demanded Hal, in a still somewhat breathless voice. "'Nope,' answered F. sturdily. "'Not unless you want exercise.' As Summer spoke, he landed another blow, this against the wind at Millard's belt line. In the same instant, Jack Benson managed to knot his hands in the fellow's coat lapels and to press the backs of his hands against the wretch's throat. "'I surrender!' gurgled the long-legged one weakly. "'You'd better, unless you want to discover that we haven't yet started in with rough handling,' retorted F. valiantly. Young Benson eased his hold on Millard's windpipe, yet all three of the submarine boys watched their prisoner, cat-like, for any new outbreak. "'Now, roll over on your face, if you want us to believe you're going to be good,' ordered Jack. Though he swore under his breath, Millard obeyed. Then something flashed in the night. Handcuffs that Jack had brought away from his meeting with Lieutenant Ritter at the hotel. Click! The steel band snapped into place around Millard's right wrist. "'Hold on! Not that!' protested the prisoner hoarsely. "'Yes, even that!' mocked Duff picking up a fragment of rock. And keep quiet, unless you want me to batter your head in. It was this rough, vigorous sea talk, backed by a belief that young Summers would prove equal to his threat, no doubt, that made Millard allow his left wrist to be brought over to meet the right. You've got those things on too tight, complained Millard sullenly. No, I don't think so, retorted Captain Jack, after looking. We need em as tight as we can have em, without causing pain, when we have a fellow like you to deal with. Now, what was that explosion? Wait a second, broke in F, in a low voice. Millard had a pal here. It was the pal I shadowed here. And that pal is running, now, with a fair-sized bundle that he came here to get. He was running when you jumped into this business, demanded Benson? Yes. Then the pal is too far away by now for us to catch him by running after him, decided Skipper Jack. Now, about that explosion. This wretch had a mine planted up on the hill, explained Hal Hastings. I was watching, at the rear, you know, and it happened that I stopped right close to the hollow where you found me. Then I saw Millard drop into that hollow, and I took a look in. I was just in time to see him bending over, to reach for the handle of a magneto battery. Now I happen to know that magneto batteries are made for the purpose of touching off explosives at a safe distance. So I jumped in on him. Just at that second, I heard you, Jack, old fellow, striking with the shovel up above there. I had to guess fast, so the whole thing struck me like a flash. Millard had been digging up there just to lead on anyone who might be shadowing him. While you were bent over the spot where he had been digging, he meant to touch off a mine that must have been planted and laid days ago. Millard, you rascal, if you suspected that you were being watched, it was your idea to lead the shadow out here, get him over that mine, and touch it off. The prisoner's eyes flashed. That was your game, wasn't it? demanded Benson angrily. Find out if you can, growled the prisoner. You've guessed it, Hal, nodded Jack, then shuddered. Had I followed this villain out here alone, and then gone to digging, unwarned, where I had seen him digging, 
my remains would have come down in four counties. But, you mean scoundrel, you never happened to think that you'd be trailed by three different fellows, all at different points along your trail. This is where my account comes in, interposed F. Summers. You remember the village you sent me to, Jack? Well, all I could find out was that, a few days ago, a chap named Gray had come along and hired a little schooner that's about twice as fast as any other sailing craft in these parts. He hired two fishermen to sail it for him, when he got ready. His crew have been wondering since when he'd be ready. Since he made the deal, Gray has just been hanging around and doing nothing. My informant pointed out Gray to me. Right after that, I vanished, but I kept an eye on Gray. When he left the village, so did I. The trail led up here. Gray went to a pile of dead brush that had been heaped up. He prowled under the brush, brought out a wooden box that had been hidden there, and from the box took a bundle. He started off with it. I figured that bundle was what we wanted. I didn't want to take the chance of tackling him and having him get the best of me, so I started to follow. Just then, I heard the rumpus up here. Maybe I did wrong, but I figured we could get Gray again, so I hustled up here to help. This wretch Millard and I had a pretty rough and tumble time of it, Hal broke in. At last, though, he gave me a blow in the wind that put me right down and out for a little while. Then he got the handle of the magneto and pumped it. Glad I started down the slope just when I did, nodded Skipper Jack dryly. If I hadn't, well, what's the use of talking about it? Forcing Millard to get upon his feet, the boys inspected first the magneto battery to which was attached wire buried in the ground. Then up the slope they went to find a miniature crater some ten feet deep and at least fourteen feet across where the mine had been exploded. Say, it's hard even yet to understand why I wasn't killed, muttered Jack Benson. But here we are, standing here, thinking about ourselves, when that fellow Gray is getting away with the package that we ought to have. Come along, fellows, and you, Millard, if you try to hold back on us, you'll learn some new things in the way of discomfort. Thus warned and realizing that his determined young captors were in a savage frame of mind, the long-legged one didn't try to lag. All four appeared in the village in which F. had prowled for information. The appearance of the handcuffed prisoner stirred up a lot of curiosity. F., however, showed his written authorization for taking Millard in the name of the United States government, so no one offered the captive any aid or sympathy. But the submarine boys met with disturbing news. They heard that a little more than a half an hour before, Gray, still carrying a big package, had embarked on his chartered schooner and had put to sea. Had we better charter something and go in chase, wondered Hal? What's the use, demanded one of the fishermen. The Juanita is four miles or more out to sea by this time, and the night's dark, you couldn't see her and there's no craft hereabouts fast enough to catch the Juanita. Besides, whispered Jack in his chum's ear, we have no power to overhaul a craft at sea. So, making the best of the situation, the submarine boys hired a driver, horse, and wagon at the village and started on their return to town. End of Mr. Gray Makes New Trouble Chapter 11 of The Submarine Boys for the Flag. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ashley M. The Submarine Boys for the Flag by Victor G. Durham, facing the Secretary of the Navy. Jack was the first to enter Lieutenant Ritter's room at the hotel. The young engineer officer jumped out of his chair, looking somewhat angry. "'Look here, Benson,' expostulated the lieutenant. "'What sort of way is this to use me? Here I've been loafing about here for hours, and you haven't sent or brought me word of any kind, you—' "'We've brought you something better,' smiled Jack Benson, throwing the door further open. "'Here's Millard himself.' 
Millard came in, a policeman at his side. The submarine boys had hailed the first policeman they met inside the city limits, and had explained to him. "'This man is wanted as a United States prisoner, is he, sir?' inquired the policeman. "'Yes, if his name is Millard,' replied Lieutenant Ritter. "'Oh, this is Millard, all right,' confirmed Jack Benson. "'Then shall I leave the fellow with you, sir?' inquired the policeman. "'Yes, of course, and thank you.' "'You'll give me a receipt for the fellow, as a United States prisoner?' hinted the policeman. "'As a United States suspect,' corrected Lieutenant Ritter, going to a table on which were writing materials. The policeman was handed the desired documents, then withdrew. Then Ritter went to a telephone, calling up Major Woodruff. "'The Major will be here in about ten minutes,' announced Ritter, hanging up the receiver. "'In the meantime, we will do no talking in the presence of this suspect.' It was just a little less than ten minutes later when Major Woodruff, accompanied by a corporal and two private soldiers, entered the room. Miller was at once taken away, under guard. Then the boys told their stories, quickly, comprehensively. "'I'll have to get a clear wire all the way through to Washington,' declared Major Woodruff, promptly, going to the telephone. In a minute more he had arranged matters and hurried to the table to write his dispatch. Ere the major had finished writing, a messenger boy was at the door. "'Boy, you'll find my automobile at the hotel entrance,' stated Major Woodruff. "'Give this car to my chauffeur, and he'll take you on the jump to the telegraph office. Then come back in the automobile and wait for more work.' "'Do you expect anyone in Washington to get that message now, after ten o'clock at night?' Jack asked wonderingly. "'Tonight,' repeated Major Woodruff. "'Yes, sir.' You haven't much idea, I take it, Mr. Benson, how fast government business travels. Within five minutes, the first part of my message will be tickling out on a receiver in the War Department. The Army officer in charge will get the Secretary of War over the telephone. Why, my answer will very likely be here inside of twenty minutes. It was thirty minutes, exactly, when a messenger placed a telegram in Major Woodruff's hands. As soon as the messenger had gone outside, the Major read this telegram. Keep prisoner Miller to close confinement pending further orders. Have communicated Secretary of Navy. Latter official says, sea chase shall be made to catch fellow Gray on Juanita. If submarine boys will accept sea service, briefly, for Navy Department, have them come to night's train and report Secretary Navy at nine tomorrow morning. Their expenses borne by government. Signed, Secretary of War. "'What does that mean, sir?' cried Jack Benson, rising. "'About if we will accept sea service and reporting in the morning to the Secretary of the Navy at Washington.' "'Why, I belong to the Army,' replied Major Woodruff, hauling out his watch, "'and this is a Navy matter. However, since one of you youngsters knows Gray by sight, and all of you familiar with this business, I imagine the Secretary of the Navy wants to put you out to sea on one of the country's gunboats to aid in the chase. For any real information, however, you'll have to apply in person to the Secretary of the Navy himself. Are you going to Washington? Are we going? Jack started to repeat, with mild irony, when a knock at the door interrupted him. Major Woodruff opened the door to receive another telegram. Washington wakes up quickly, he laughed. Here you are, Mr. Benson, a dispatch from our other fighting department at the nation's capital. Clearing his throat, Major Woodruff read, Send description of schooner Juanita and of suspect Gray, as mentioned in your telegram, Secretary War. Our submarine boys leaving tonight to report in the morning, Secretary of Navy. Here you are, and you see you've got to make up your minds quickly, said the Major. The night train south for Washington leaves in a little more than an hour from now. Why, there's only one answer possible, sir, cried Captain Jack Benson, his eyes shining. Of course we'll take tonight's train and report to the Secretary of the Navy in the morning. Once for the flag, I don't even have to consult my comrades or look their way. I know their answer as well as I know my own. Good enough, young man, applauded Major Woodruff, while Lieutenant Ritter gave Jack a hearty slap across the shoulders. But... To go to the Navy Department, you'll want citizens' clothes, not your present uniforms, which are not official. I could send my auto to your boat, and you can be back here in forty minutes if you dress quickly. Ready for the word forward, sir, responded Captain Jack, saluting. 
Hal and F also raised their hands to their foreheads. It was a swift trip, with some hurried dressing on board the Spitfire, but Major Woodruff landed them at the railway station ten minutes ahead of train time. "'Good fortune, gentlemen,' wished Major Woodruff, pressing the hand of each when the train was ready. "'Don't be scared when you find yourself face to face with so big a man as the secretary.' It is not to be wondered at if the minds of all were in a bit of a whirl as they made for their berths in a sleeping car. After all, muttered Jack to himself as he undressed in the berth, it's strange how some fellows get the cream of things. Here we get the trip to Washington, while Lieutenant Ritter will have only the fun of going out to the cliff above Cobtown tomorrow to have a look at what is left of Miller's mine. Their train brought the submarine boys into Washington just before seven in the morning. There was time for a good breakfast. Then, being strangers at the National Capitol, the youngsters engaged a cab to take them to the imposing building that shelters the State, War, and Navy Departments. Jack Benson sent in his card. Five minutes later, the three submarine boys were ushered into the presence of the Secretary of the Navy. End of Facing the Secretary of the Navy Recording by Ashley M. Chapter 12 of The Submarine Boys for the Flag. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Dickerman, Claremont, New Hampshire. The Submarine Boys for the Flag by Victor G. Durham. Chapter 12. Navy officers for an hour or a day. So you're really the three famous submarine boys, inquired Secretary Sanders, rising from his chair and extending his hand. We're submarine boys. That's all I ever heard about it, Mr. Secretary, replied Captain Jack, as he introduced his friends. Now, be seated, young gentlemen, and tell me all you know about this matter that has brought you over to Washington. Jack Benson acted as spokesman, telling the whole tale clearly, yet using up no more time in talk than was absolutely necessary. It was a good, concise business statement. Now, of course, pursued Mr. Sanders, you wonder what the Navy Department wants you to do. Well, in the first place, we've been asking, by wireless, through the night and early morning, to have all craft on the lookout for a schooner answering to the description of the Juanita. Secretary Sanders paused, but none of the boys asked any questions. You will wonder, of course, what success we've had so far, and I may say that our success has been ample, resumed the Secretary of the Navy, with an amused smile. In other words, we've been able to pick up news of three schooners all of which answer to the general description of the Juanita. But it happens that that isn't the name of any one of the three. Jack Benson nodded, but did not speak. Of course, pursued the secretary, it may be that the skipper of the Juanita has tried an old trick through the night. He may have set a man to painting another name at the schooner's stern. Again, Skipper Jack nodded. The schooner that we think most likely to be the Juanita is about fifty miles out at sea now, according to a report received twenty minutes ago. Evidently, she is headed for one of the British West Indies. Now, if the wind continues the same, and the suspected vessel keeps to her present course, she will, at five this afternoon, be off the Norfolk Navy Yard and some sixty-two miles out at sea. Now, unless we are otherwise advised, we want a gunboat, the Sudbury, now at Norfolk, to overhaul the suspected schooner and ascertain whether she is really the Juanita, and whether the man, Gray, and his bundle of documents are still on board. The suspected vessel is to be searched, and Gray and the documents, if found, are to be seized, and the schooner then released. Do you understand? Perfectly, sir, Jack answered quietly. One of you young men will know Gray at a glance. The other two are familiar with the whole case. Otherwise, it would not have been necessary to have called you into this matter. 
yet to overhaul a vessel or to make an arrest or a seizure you require authority such authority can be vested only in naval officers hence for the present it will be necessary to give all three of you appointments as officers in the united states navy at this announcement jack benson lost for the moment some of his cool composure officers of the navy sir he gasped but his eyes glowed at the mere thought you will be officers only temporarily returned the secretary you are not of age any of you i take it we are all just about the same age sir seventeen nearly eighteen jack replied just so now none of you could legally hold officers commissions except by a special act of congress however with the approval of the president it is legal for me to give you special temporary appointments under which you have the title rank pay and command of officers these appointments i am going to give you and for a brief while though you will not have commissions you will nevertheless be as actually officers of the navy as are any admirals on the list this astonishing statement almost took away the breath of the submarine boys you are familiar with navigation benson and are a capable enough sea pilot along this coast i learned that much early this morning through mr farnham's answer to my telegram then mr farnham knows what we are going to do asked jack quickly he doesn't replied secretary sanders with a shake of his head mr farnham knows only that you have a chance to be of some service to the navy he seemed to be much pleased by our inquiry the secretary had just touched an electric button on his desk now a clerk entered the room telephone the secretary of the president directed mr sanders and ask him whether the president has examined and approved the special appointments that i sent over a while ago the clerk was quickly back to say the special appointments mr secretary are duly approved and are now on their way over from the white house two minutes later a messenger entered handing a sealed envelope to the secretary of the navy breaking the seal mr sanders drew forth three heavy folded sheets of parchment here you are mr benson resumed the secretary handing over one of the parchments this document confers upon you for the time being the rank pay and command of a lieutenant junior grade in the united states navy you mr hastings and you mr summers will rank as ensigns under your special appointments jack's head swam a bit as he thanked mr sanders then he started to glance over this marvelous document but the secretary of the navy now cut in briskly that is all gentlemen you know your instructions in general lieutenant benson you will now go to my chief clerk who will swear you into the service he will also give you an order on a local tailor for the uniforms of your ranks in one hour and twenty minutes your train starts south on arrival at norfolk you will report without an instant's delay at the navy yard aboard the sudbury you will receive all further instructions wired from the department good morning gentlemen then indeed things moved fast at the desk of the chief clerk of the navy department the three budding naval officers stood with their right hands raised while the official at the other side of the desk administered to them the oath binding them to loyalty to the government and to obedience to all lawful orders of their superiors and now gentlemen continued the chief clerk i will send for ensign mcgrath who is on duty here and present you to him he will go with you to the tailors and will see that you are properly rushed to the train that you are to take remember you are not to pay for your uniforms or equipment the bill will be sent here ensign mcgrath looked sleepy but proved to be a hustler one of the department's autos was out in the grounds and into this mcgrath bundled the three submarine boys five minutes later they were in the tailoring establishment 
where a good many ready-made uniforms were kept for sale. What a whirl it was! Yet, in twenty minutes, each submarine boy found himself in the duty uniform of a United States junior naval officer, each uniform adorned with the insignia of the wearer's rank. In the meantime, dress suitcases had been procured from a store nearby. All right and proper, nodded Ensign McGrath, and, I'm not throwing bouquets, gentlemen, but you really look as though you had been born for the uniforms. Now, only one thing is missing, the swords. Are we to wear swords? asked Jack, his face flushing with pleasure. Under certain conditions, on-duty naval officers wear swords. You will need them as parts of your equipments. The dealer brought these sidearms at once. The naval sword is a handsome one, vastly more natty than the infantry sidearm of a junior officer. What a thrill each submarine boy felt as he was shown how to adjust his sword to the belt. They're really nonsensical jewelry in these civilized days, declared Ensign McGrath dryly, but the regulations call for swords at some times. Now, gentlemen, you will need to get your uniforms off as quickly as you can, and the tailor's helpers will pack them in your suitcases. You travel in citizens' clothes and don your uniforms as soon as you get aboard the gunboat. Ten minutes later, each proud submarine boy picked up his suitcase and sword, the latter, in each instance, being inside of a chamois skin carrying case. In single file, they made their way to the street. Now for the last leg of the race in Washington, announced Ensign McGrath, as they entered the automobile once more. I wonder if it will happen on the way or at the station, laughed Jack, as the government gas wagon whirled them down Pennsylvania Avenue. Will what happen? inquired McGrath. Why, laughed Benson again, I know we've got to wake up out of this trance, but I can't figure when it's going to happen. I suppose all of you do feel excited, nodded Ensign McGrath understandingly. Not excited, declared Jack. I'm just simply unprepared to believe that any part of this has really happened. At the railway station they were met by a messenger from the chief clerk's office, who handed each of the submarine boys a small parcel. Copy of the regulations, sir, stated the messenger. It is required that each officer of the Navy possess a copy. You'll want to scan the book good and hard most of the way down to Norfolk, advised Ensign McGrath. You'll find much between the covers that you'll need to know right at the first jump off. And now for the tickets. These McGrath bought, including parlor car seats. The ensign then saw them safely to their seats. Now, you've got enough to do reading your new books, laughed the ensign, so I'm not going to waste your time by staying here to talk to you. It's ten minutes yet to the time of your departure. Goodbye, gentlemen, and good luck. When McGrath had gone, Jack leaned across the aisle to whisper, F, can you get your sword handily? To draw it, I mean? What's up? said F, suspiciously. I want you to stick about a sixteenth of an inch of the point of your sword into me, so I can judge how long I've been dreaming. What's the matter with using your own sword? demanded F, a trifle gruffly. That's just the trouble, smiled Benson plaintively. I'm afraid I'll wake up and find I haven't any. Hal was leaning back in his parlor car chair, his eyes closed. He was dreaming delicious daydreams. End of chapter 12「Lieutenant Benson, sir, inquired a coxswain, saluting. Yes, replied Jack, returning the salute. 
The gig is waiting to take you to the Sudbury, sir. This information was punctuated by another salute, which Jack, as head of the party of three young officers, again returned. Lead the way, directed Jack. For the third time saluting, the coxswain possessed himself of Jack's suitcase and sword, then crossed the wharf to the landing stairs down below. The gunboat's cutter waited, a natty little craft, occupied by a bowman and four oarsmen. The three young officers seated themselves at the stern of the gig. Cast off, directed the coxswain. Up oars, let fall, give way. With the long, steady, magnificent sweep of the navy which the sailors pulled, the little gig seemed to race through the water. Is that the Sudbury? inquired Jack, nodding toward a trim little gunboat some two hundred feet long. Yes, sir. All three of the submarine boys gazed at the gunboat with secret enthusiasm. Had it not been for the guns fore and aft, and at the rail on either side, the Sudbury might have been mistaken for some multimillionaire's yacht. In another moment the gig was making fast at the gangway. Then Jack Benson stepped out, and, heading his comrades, went up over the side. At the head of the gangway, a corporal and four marines stood drawn up. At a low voice command from the corporal, the marines presented arms, standing thus until the three new young officers, saluting, passed. Just beyond the marines stood an officer of the navy. He brought his hand to his cap in a smart salute. Lieutenant Benson, inquired this officer. Yes, I am Ensign Fullerton, executive officer of this vessel. They shook hands, and Jack presented his comrades. I think I had better show you to your cabin, sir, suggested Ensign Fullerton. As you please, nodded Jack. The way was actually led, however, by three of the Marines, who, at a word from the corporal, had possessed themselves of the limited baggage of the new arrivals. In Jack's cabin was a broad double berth, two deep wardrobe closets, a bookcase, desk, and several chairs. I had no idea junior officers had such roomy quarters, murmured Jack. They don't usually, sir, smiled Fullerton, but it's different, of course, in the case of the commanding officer. But I'm not the commanding officer, gasped Jack. For the purposes of this cruise you are, smiled Fullerton, but I forget, you haven't received your orders. There they are on your desk. They arrived less than an hour ago by wire. Like one in a dream, young Jack Benson picked up a bulky telegraph envelope and broke the seal. There, before his eyes, danced the words of the latest order from the Secretary of the Navy. Lieutenant Jack Benson was directed to take command of the United States gunboat Sudbury until further orders. Ensign's Hastings and Summers were directed to assume such duties aboard as were assigned to them by Lieutenant Benson. I didn't expect this, stammered Jack. I, I, we thought our temporary rank in the Navy was given us merely that we might have legal standing in making one arrest that is wanted. No one ever does know just what is wanted of him until the order comes, laughed Ensign Fullerton. At least, that has been the case since Mr. Sanders became Secretary of the Navy. He keeps all officers on the jump, but I guess that is what a good many of them need, sir. As the ensign appeared to be at least twenty-five years old, that respectful sir struck young Benson's ear queerly. Pardon me, gentlemen, but be seated, suggested Lieutenant Jack, suddenly, as he realized that his chums and this one sure-enough naval officer were all standing. You have been aboard naval vessels before, sir, haven't you? asked Ensign Fullerton. Oh, yes, but never in the present way, smiled Benson. Then, no doubt, you understand, sir, that the Sudbury is under steam, only awaiting your order to put to sea. The last part of these orders, replied Jack, picking up the telegram, advises me that sailing orders will be wired soon. Then may I make a suggestion, sir? Of course, nodded young Benson. At your direction, I will have Mr. Hastings and Mr. Summers shown to their cabins. Then I will send for the one other young man left on the gunboat's old equipment of officers and present him to you. 
After that, I would suggest, sir, that I have the crew piped to quarters for brief inspection by the new commanding officer. Hal and F. were quickly made acquainted with their own cabins, which were on the port side of the gun deck, Jack's being on the starboard. Ensign Fullerton brought in a slim, very erect young man in a midshipman's uniform, Mr. Drake, just out of the Naval Academy. Our engineers are all warrant machinists or petty officers, no commissioned officers among them, stated Fullerton. Our highest marine officer is Sergeant Oswald. Besides the sergeant, we have eighteen other enlisted men among the marines. Here is the ship's complete roster, continued the ensign taking a document out of a pigeonhole over the young commander's desk. And now, sir, shall I pass the order for piping the crew to quarters? If you will be so good, Jack nodded, rising. At this moment, Hal and F. appeared at the doorway. Pardon me, gentlemen, for suggesting that you had better put your swords on, suggested Fullerton. Inspection of crew at quarters is about to come off. Hal and F. vanished, but soon reappeared, wearing their new swords and trying hard not to look conscious of the fact. Jack was engaged in adjusting his own sidearm to his belt. "'I neglected to state, sir,' continued Ensign Fullerton, "'that we have no medical officer at present. A hospital steward down in sick bay is our nearest approach, at present, to a medical officer.' "'Forewarned is forearmed,' laughed Jack. "'We'll try not to be ill.' It was time now to proceed to the quarter-deck, for forward the shrill sound of the boatswain's whistle seemed to fill the air. Though all the crew, including the marines, had been summoned and formed at the mast, the inspection was but a matter of a moment. Its purpose was more to give the crew a glimpse of their new officers. Just as the inspection was ending, a marine of the guard approached, announcing in low tone, telegram for the commanding officer, sir. Ensign Fullerton received it, returning the Marine's salute, and passed the envelope to Jack Benson, who opened it. Our sailing orders, Mr. Fullerton, announced Jack, as soon as the former had dismissed the formation at the mast. This telegram gives, as you see, the latest reported position of the schooner believed to be the Juanita and her course. You will get under way at once, Mr. Fullerton, then you and I will work out the course. This is a starboard watch, sir, continued the executive officer. Which officer is to command it? Mr. Hastings. Mr. Summers will take the port watch. Very good, sir. And I would suggest, sir, that Mr. Drake is an excellent pilot between here and the sea. Then direct Mr. Drake to take the bridge with the watch officer. Very good, sir. And as soon as we are under way, Mr. Fullerton, come to my cabin and we will figure out our course more in detail. Very good, sir. It was Ensign Fullerton who, acting as executive officer, transmitted the needed orders to Hal F. and Midshipman Drake. The three young officers now removed their swords, sending them by a marine orderly to their respective cabins. Hal took command from the bridge, subject to Fullerton's directions, while Jack, as commanding officer, also took his station there briefly. F., being free to do as he pleased for the time, went to his cabin to try to figure out whether he was dreaming. Quickly the Sudbury left her anchorage, proceeding downstream. As soon as the start had been fairly made, Ensign Fullerton reported at the cabin of the young commanding officer. They worked out on the chart the probable positions that the suspected schooner would take that afternoon. We should sight her at about five o'clock, sir, if she doesn't change her course, and if the wind holds the same, said Ensign Fullerton. If we get the right craft first off, it will be a short cruise, won't it? smiled Jack rather wistfully. I, I, began Ensign Fullerton slowly, then paused. Well, smiled Jack Benson. On second thought, I believe I had better not say what I started to say, replied the ensign. Oh, go ahead, Fullerton, urged Jack. It isn't easy to wound my sensibilities. I was going to say, sir, replied the ensign, flushing a bit, 
that I quite understand how you feel about a short cruise. The sensation of holding a command in the United States Navy is one that you would not care to give up too soon. I was thinking of something of the sort, Benson admitted, but see here. On one point, my orders don't quite enlighten me. If the suspected schooner proves not to be the right, are we to come back to report the fact? If you were so to order, replied Fullerton, yet you do not need to. This vessel is equipped with wireless, and you are in instant communication at every moment of the day and night with the Navy Department at Washington. I'm glad of that, admitted Lieutenant Benson, frankly. It will lessen the danger of my making a fool of myself during my first and last naval command. Not your last command, I hope, remarked the ensign. The only way I could get a permanent command, retorted Jack, would be to get appointed to Annapolis, if I could, and then work through the long, long years for command rank. There are other ways, replied Ensign Fullerton quietly, and especially if a war should break out. Young men trained as finely as you and your comrades, and showing as great talent, sir, would have no difficulty in reaching important rank in a war of the future, when so much must be risked on the submarine craft of which you young men are masters. We have run a few submarine boats, I suppose, nodded Benson, but none of us has ever had the Annapolis training. Not all the best American sea fighters have come out of Annapolis, sir, replied Fullerton soberly. If a boy gets through Annapolis, there's nothing wonderful in his making a fairly good officer. But my cap, sir, is off to the boys who can come through the ordinary machine shop and qualify themselves to command submarine boats or anything else afloat. Then, Dropping back to his ordinary manner, Fullerton saluted, next left the cabin to carry to the watch officer the orders for the course. Lieutenant Jack Benson, briefly of the U.S. Navy, strolled out to the after deck for a short promenade. Here he was joined by F. Summers, who, in his naval uniform, did not forget to salute before accosting the commanding officer of the USS Sudbury. I'm really beginning to feel that I'm not dreaming, confided F., almost in a whisper. Whee! But it's fine to be out on a craft so big that you don't get a cramp in your leg from walking. Say, do you know, Jack, he whispered, I am almost crazy to see one of this ship's big guns fired. You may have your wish, laughed Jack. Who knows? Who knew, indeed? How was it possible, for that matter, for any of these three young officers to guess what lay ahead of them. End of chapter 13、chapter、14 of the Submarine Boys for the Flag. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Don Will, Oakland, California. The Submarine Boys for the Flag by Victor G. Durham. Chapter 14. The Bow Gun Booms and F Puts Off. In the 19th century, when a vessel left port, her destination unknown, that craft might get away from a pursuing squadron scattered over the seas. At best, knowledge of a marine fugitive's whereabouts could be gained only from the masters of other vessels that had sighted the fugitive. Usually, such information must be delayed until the informing master of the sighting ship reached port. In the 20th century, all was greatly changed. A vessel bound for parts unknown, carrying some fugitive from justice, is sighted by some steamship that is equipped with a wireless telegraph outfit. Hours before, perhaps, the master of the steamship has been asked to keep a weather eye open for a vessel that answers the name or description of the runaway craft. Now she is sighted by the master of the steamship. Ten minutes later, the authorities on shore know the exact whereabouts of the fleeing craft. Should she change her course wholly, 
her new whereabouts is soon after reported to land by the master of some other wireless equipped steamship once upon a time the task of finding and overtaking a runaway vessel at sea presented innumerable difficulties nowadays it is often necessary only that the pursuing craft possess sufficiently greater speed to overtake the easily located fugitive as the sudbury turned out into the open sea that little gunboat was in instant communication with washington and also with any wireless equipped ocean traveler up to nearly halfway across the great atlantic at three o'clock the navy department at washington reported to a gunboat out of sight of land that the last sighting of the supposed juanita placed her on the same course as hitherto reported at four o'clock came word that the navy department had had no new report as to the schooner by wireless at five o'clock another wireless dispatch was flashed through the air lieutenant jack benson reading discovered that the Juanita had again been sighted on the same course, headed for some port in the British West Indies. At 5.20, Ensign F. Somers, port watch officer of the Sudbury, sent a marine orderly to report to Lieutenant Benson that a schooner's topmasts were within sight. Benson hurried to the bridge, but found Ensign Fullerton there just ahead of him. We'll shape our course in straight pursuit of the schooner, Mr. Fullerton, decided Lieutenant Jack. Very good, sir. As yet the schooner's topmasts were visible only from the military top. After a few minutes had passed, however, the vessel's masts were visible from the bridge. Does your rig look like that of the Juanita, Mr. Somers? questioned young Benson. I can't say, sir, F. replied. I didn't see her at Cobtown under sail. I shall have to wait until I can make out the hole, sir, before I can make even a good guess. Smoke was pouring heavily from the Sudbury's two funnels by this time, for the gunboat was being pushed under forced draft to considerably better than twenty knots an hour. The schooner apparently was making between seven and eight knots an hour. In a few minutes more, the hull of the stranger began to show. F, with a pair of marine glasses to his eyes, studied the stranger long and carefully. Lieutenant Benson, knowing it would be folly to hasten his comrade's judgment, waited in silent patience. That craft looks very much like the Juanita, sir, ventured F at last. In fact, sir, I think that's our schooner. Steer up to windward of her then, Mr. Somers, Jack directed. Mr. Fullerton, give orders to have the port bow gun manned. When the order is given, be prepared to fire a blank shot toward the schooner. If after one minute the schooner shows no signs of heaving to, then fire a solid shot across her bows. Very good, sir. Without leaving the bridge, Ensign Fullerton passed the word for the manning of the gun and loading with a blank cartridge. There was a new, deeper glow in F. Somers' eyes as he paced the bridge. He was to have at last his wish to see the Sudbury fire a shot. In a few minutes more, the Sudbury was ranging tip alongside the schooner, though a full quarter of a mile away to windward. Mr. Fullerton, fire the blank shot at the stranger, ordered Lieutenant Jack Benson. Aye, aye, sir. The order was carried by a simple wave of the executive officer's hand. The petty officer in command behind the bow gun, looking for the signal, saw it and gave a low-toned order. Bang! F. was watching for it. His eyes danced as he heard the sharp explosion and saw the cloud of white smoke, with the tongue of fire spitting through the center of it. In most of us there is left some of the spirit of the old Norse pirate, F. had a lot of it. The people on the schooner act as though they were bewildered, smiled Jack, watching the schooner through his glass. It doesn't look as though they expected any such order from us. I wonder if they mean to obey. Worse for them if they don't, replied Ensign Fullerton grimly. A solid shot across the bows and a shot through their rigging after that. 
what schooner has any chance to defy a ship of war there they go around cried jack barely above his breath they'll heave too of course smiled fullerton your orders sir lower the power launch send a corporal and four marines and six sailors armed beside the boat handlers mr somers will take command as he's the only one of us who knows the fellow gray by sight ensign fullerton accordingly transmitted the orders also ordering midshipman drake up to the bridge to serve as watch officer in f's absence hal hastings was asleep in his cabin at the time in the meantime the schooner continued hove to several men lining her starboard rail somehow mr fullerton muttered lieutenant jack after f had departed in the power launch with his boarding crew i'm not much inclined to think that's our schooner somers seemed to think so mr somers said it looks like the juanita he's too careful to commit himself to more than that we'll soon know sir anyway it is probable that f was disappointed that the schooner had been stopped by anything less than a round shot through her rigging yet as he stood up in the stern of the launch as it bounded over the waves he felt a heap of satisfaction in the thought that he commanded the searching party and that he did so by virtue of being an officer in the united states navy and this too was a form of duty in which ensign somers wore his sword at his side i hope they're preparing a surprise for us chuckled f as he looked about him at his armed crew i hope the schooner's people will try some mean trick for us or attempt to put up a fight we yet none of these aggressive thoughts showed in the young ensign's face f knew his place usually and the amount of dignity that went with any place make fast alongside f sang out as the launch rounded in alongside the schooner what's wrong with the united states navy midshipman came the jovial question from a bronzed broad-shouldered bearded man of fifty who appeared at the quarter rail offering f a hand to aid him on board but f disdaining the proffered hand seized the rail vaulting neatly on board then he straightened up i am ensign somers from the gunboat sudbury ensign eh muttered the schooner's master looking in some bewilderment at f's boyish face i beg your pardon mr somers what craft is this sir f continued schooner varia from new york bound for jamaica we saw varia painted on your stern of course smiled f but was that name painted there during the night sir demanded the skipper in some astonishment oh i see ensign your commander thinks we may be sailing under false colors will you be kind enough to step down into my cabin here an elderly man in yachting dress stepped forward out of a group of sailors at the waist of the craft this schooner is chartered to convey he began but f interposed politely pardon me sir but i am talking with the captain only then turning toward the launch ensign somers called corporal board with your marines and wait further orders then f followed the captain below the gentleman who spoke to you explained varia's master is dr herman barnard he chartered the varia at new york for a west indian cruise for himself and his family here are my papers as master here is the varia's license to carry passengers and here are our clearance papers from new york to jamaica the papers were all in regular order f looked them over noting that the master's name was walford i don't see anything wrong here captain walford f continued where is your list of passengers here sir f glanced over the list noting that besides dr barnard there were five other men passengers besides mrs barnard her two daughters and one other woman i shall have to ask you captain to line your passengers up on deck f continued 
I had hoped to escape that annoyance, sir, protested the schooner's master. The ladies were alarmed and took to their staterooms. I am very sorry, Captain, F. insisted, but I must look over the passengers. Very good, then, sighed Captain Walford, and muster the crew forward. I must see on deck every person on this craft. Very good, sir. F. returned to deck, leaning against the starboard rail of the quarter-deck. Below he heard some sounds of remonstrance in feminine voices. Then, as a step sounded on the after companionway, and F. straightened up, he heard a woman's voice say, United States Navy, I would call this a good deal more like piracy. But Mama, hush, child. Mrs. Barnard, when she stepped on deck, looked as severe as her husband appeared mild. Ensign F. doffed his cap quickly to the ladies. I know this does not please you, he said courteously, but I will ask you to remember that I am acting under orders and have no choice. It is outrageous to stop a pleasure craft in this fashion, declared Mrs. Barnard haughtily. Do you know why we are making this search, madam? asked F. sweetly. Of course I don't, snapped the good lady. Then I marvel, replied F. with another bow, that you can have an opinion of something that you don't understand. One of the girls was so undutiful as to snigger. Thereupon one of the young men joined in the laugh, which became so general that the severe expression on Mrs. Barnard's face softened considerably. Perhaps I owe you an apology, young man, for having spoken as I did of you, admitted the good lady. You only called us pirates, smiled F. That wasn't much. Perhaps I said more than I should have said, young man, admitted Mrs. Barnard. Mama, wouldn't it be better to address this officer by his title, asked the elder of the girls. Then turning to F., the same speaker inquired, May I ask your title? Are you a captain? Only an ensign, miss, F. replied, and only an acting ensign at that. While this brief conversation had been going on, the cook, stewards, and watch below were being routed out. Now Captain Walford came aft to report. All hands on board, sir, have been turned out for your inspection. All, insisted F. All, sir. Then, Captain Walford, I am going to do something that may appear very extreme, but I regret to say that I can't help it. I must search this craft. If I allowed one for whom we are seeking to slip through our fingers, it would bring a lot of blame down about my head. F. now stepped back to the rail, ordering six of the sailors on board. To them he gave his orders. The party spread going below. F., excusing himself to the ladies, went with the sailors. No more thorough search could have been made. Every nook and cranny of the schooner was searched, but at last F. was obliged to admit that the man he sought was not aboard. My apologies to everyone for all trouble caused, declared Ensign Somers. I trust you will find it easy to believe that I have only been following my orders and therefore doing my duty. You couldn't have done less, Ensign, replied Dr. Barnard courteously. You couldn't have been more courteous. Are we at liberty to proceed on our way, sir? asked Captain Walford, as the young acting ensign went over the side. I shall have to ask you to take the signal for that from the Sudbury, F. answered. On the gunboat's quarter deck, following Ensign Somers' report, there was an anxious conference. If this is the craft we've been following all the time, muttered Jack Benson, we have a lot of hunting yet ahead of us. Shall I signal the schooner permission to proceed, sir? asked Ensign Fullerton. By all means. Darkness came down over the ocean while Lieutenant Jack was sending a wireless despatch through the air to the Navy Department. End of chapter 14
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Don Will, Oakland, California. The Submarine Boys for the Flag by Victor G. Durham. Chapter 15. The Right Boat and the Right Crew. Three hours later, under a new order from Washington, the gunboat's launch stole in alongside of a second schooner that had been pursued, overhauled, and brought to a standstill. This craft, however, proved to be a Nova Scotian vessel, with papers all right, a cargo beyond suspicion, and no sign of the fugitive Gray aboard. When news of this second failure had been flashed to Washington, and twenty minutes more had passed, the instructions came back out of the ether. Cruise slowly about where you are. Await new instructions which will go forward to you as soon as we have fresh, reliable information from any source. See that your own searchlight is freely used through the night. Puss in the corner at sea, muttered Lieutenant Benson, and we ain't even find a corner. An hour later, the young commander of the Sudbury turned in. Hal was on the bridge. The gunboat cruised along lazily at about eight knots an hour. For some time, Hal paced the bridge indolently, while the sailor lookout forward manipulated the searchlight, sending its beam in wide circles over the waters. It was within half an hour of the time of calling the new watch, in fact, when the bow watch reported, Sail dead ahead, sir. Barely more than a topsail could be made out, even through the marine glass of the young watch officer. Hold the light on her. We'll overtake and examine her anyway, was Ensign Hastings' quick decision. From the bridge he gave orders for the engine room to go ahead with increased speed. While the gunboat was bounding off after the stranger, time came to call the port watch. F. Somers came up to the bridge, somewhat sleepy. Same old story, I guess, yawned F. Have you passed the word to the executive officer? Not yet, Hal replied. I didn't believe it worth while to break the slumber of Mr. Fullerton or of the commander until we got close to see whether the stranger looks in the least like the Juanita. I don't believe the Juanita is anywhere on this wide ocean, muttered F, stifling a yawn. It doesn't look that way, smiled Hastings. Down before the wheelhouse a bell began to sound briskly. Eight bells, your watch, Mr. Somers, announced Hastings. But I am going to remain on the bridge with you for a while. I want to look at that mud hooker over yonder. Within fifteen minutes more, the gunboat was running fairly close, though off to starboard. That doesn't look even a little bit like the Juanita, muttered Ensign F. disgustedly. Why, she's longer than the Cobtown schooner. Besides, the Juanita is a two-sticker, while that hooker yonder has a third mast, with a yawl rig leg of mutton sail. Hal said nothing, but continued to study the stranger through his night glass. She is a queer-looking hooker, muttered Hastings. Say, F, somehow that boat doesn't look as though she was built to fit her own rig. Why not, demanded F. Well, look at her length then take a peep at the height of her dory mast. Does it look tall enough for the length of the schooner? I hadn't thought of that, admitted Somers, also taking a careful look through the night glass. Jove, Hal, she is an odd-looking piece of hulk. F turned to pass the order to run in still closer to the schooner. What's wrong with her stern hull? asked Ensign Somers three or four minutes later. Looks like a patchwork affair, declared Hal, more interested than ever. Has she a built-on stern, demanded Somers, half a minute later? By Jove, I half believe she has. F, without that stern and the yawl mast, would you say the craft looks like the Juanita? I believe she would, muttered young Somers excitedly. Marine orderly? A sea soldier came quickly up the bridge stairs, saluting. 
Mr. Somers compliments to Mr. Fullerton, and will the executive officer come to the bridge? Again saluting, the Marine vanished aft. It doesn't take a naval officer long to report, even when he has to rouse himself out of a sound sleep to do it. Ensign Fullerton reached the bridge rubbing his eyes, but he listened intently to what the two younger ensigns had to say. Marine orderly, called the executive officer. Mr. Fullerton's compliments to the commanding officer, and will he come to the bridge? Barely a minute later, Jack Benson stood on the bridge, listening to his subordinate officers and staring across the gap of water at the unknown craft. Mr. Fullerton, directed the young commander, prepare to fire a signal shot and to lower the power launch. Make up the boarding party as usual. Mr. Somers, you will go in command of the launch, and I will accompany you this time. Mr. Fullerton, when I leave the bridge, you will assume command. Both officers, as they received their orders, saluted. Bang! The signal gun barked out, the flash from the muzzle sending a long tongue of red through the darkness. But the stranger continued on her way through the night. Ensign Fullerton regarded the young commanding officer of the gunboat expectantly. Put a solid shot across her bows, Mr. Fullerton. Again the order was transmitted with little noise. The gun crew then awaited the signal from the executive officer. Bang! This time the solid shot struck the water a bare fifty feet ahead of the strange craft's bows, as she forged on through the waves, her bow stirring up a gleaming white foam. That ought to stop her, muttered Lieutenant Jack Benson impatiently. I don't believe it is going to, though, sir, reported Ensign Fullerton, studying the other vessel through his night glass. I don't see a sign of motion on the stranger's decks. Load again with solid shot, then, directed the gunboat's young commander. This time hit her square in the fore rigging. I'll step below and sight the piece myself, replied Ensign Fullerton. A few moments later, the executive officer reported the port bow gun in readiness for service. Fire whenever you are ready, Mr. Fullerton, called Lieutenant Jack in a low voice. Bang, barked the bow gun a moment later. Over aboard the stranger there was a crash, a tearing sound, and then her fore topmast toppled, hanging loosely in place by the stays. That'll stop her, I reckon, chuckled Jack Benson. And stop her it did. There was no choice but to stop. This gunboat of the United States Navy was in a position to shoot every standing stick out of the schooner if provoked too far, and the legal right to go to such lengths existed. Stranger is heaving too, sir, reported Ensign Somers. Very good, Mr. Somers. Order the power launch lowered. Put off as quickly as possible. Very good, sir. Ensign Fullerton hastened back to the bridge to assume command while Hal Hastings stood by him. Boat handlers and arm sailors and marines scampered over the side. Down the gangway followed Jack and F, looking very stately as they held their swords clear of their legs. Busily the launch chugged across the intervening water gap. Schooner ahoy, hailed F, as the launch ran in alongside. What craft is that? Schooner Malta Cooper Master from Sydney N.S., came the reply of a man at the after rail. Seems to me I've seen you before in Cobtown, suddenly exclaimed F. Somers as he leaped over the rail in advance of his marines. Cobtown? demanded the schooner's master, falteringly. By the great constitution, we've caught the Juanita in disguise, bellowed back Ensign F., turning to Jack Benson, who was just boarding. See, there's the false stern structure. You're making a huge mistake of some sort, gentlemen, protested the vessel's master tremulously. Marines lay aboard, thundered F. Take the deck, corporal. Round up all the crew you see, and make them stand at attention along one of the seams of the deck. Sailors aboard? 
Shoot down any man who tries to block or balk you. Lively now, I've seen this master in Cobb Town, and I'll take my oath. This is the Juanita with a pieced out false stern and a faked third mast. We hold you responsible for the deck, Corporal, spoke Jack in a low tone to the non-commissioned officer of Marines. We're going to take the sailors and go below. A rush was made for the companionway leading down into the schooner's cabin. A man's white, scared face showed below for a moment. Hurrah! yelled F. Somers, drawing his sword and making a bound below. There's Brother Gray. Oh, we've the right boat and the right crowd, too. End of chapter 15、Chapter、16 of the Submarine Boys for the Flag Visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shasta, Oakland, California. The Submarine Boys for the Flag by Victor G. Durham. Chapter 16. The Duel Through the Door. Bang! A stateroom door closed just before the two young officers reached it. Click! That told the story of a bolt shot into place. You may as well open, called Jack coolly. We have ample force for breaking down that door. Crack! In that confined space, the discharge of a pistol sounded almost deafening. A line of red shot through the stateroom door. The bullet from the weapon whizzed between Jack Benson and F. Summers, the missile burying itself in wood. Across the passage. Crack! Crack! With that desperate fellow, the other side of the door, shooting through the keyhole, it was worse than folly to remain in the line of range. Yet Jack and F retorted coolly with the dignity of officers. My man requested Lieutenant Jack, turning to one of the sailors, hand me your revolver. Taking the weapon, Benson glanced at it a second or two, then raised the weapon, sighting for the top of the stateroom door. Bang! The shot that Jack fired sent a bullet crashing through the door close to the upper framework. You see, Gray, Jack called coolly, we're armed too, and in overpowering numbers. Resistance is worse than foolish. Bang! came the hostile answer. This shot was fired through one of the panels of the stateroom door, fired at an angle, too. Plainly, the shot was intended to hit the young naval lieutenant. It passed Benson's right side by a margin of barely two inches. Pass me another revolver, whispered Benson in the stillness that followed. All through the day and evening, these seamen, though outwardly respectful and wholly well disciplined, had cherished a great deal of amusement over their boyish officers. Now, however, these bronzed men of the deep beheld Benson and Summers at work in a manner worthy of any product of Annapolis. The second revolver was handed to Jack. I don't want to be in this too, muttered Ensign F, and held back his hand for weapons. Are you going to surrender Gray and open that door? demanded Lieutenant Jack. Never to you, came the ugly defiance. Bang! Again Gray fired, straight in the direction of the voice, the bullet crashing through a panel of the door, fanned. Jack's left ear so that he felt the breeze. Open up on him, Mr. Summers directed Benson. Slowly, fire high and fire low. Try to get him somehow. Two more shots came from the other side of the locked door. Then, p 
Pop, 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 began the fuselage from outside, Jack and F firing with either hand as they sighted their weapons for new spots. Rip, crash. A long enough bombardment of this sort was certain to reduce the panels to splinters and leave the way clear if they didn't riddle gray with bullets in the meantime pop 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 the air was becoming heavy with the white fog of smoke breathing was somewhat difficult with so many shots being fired in the confined space then both young officers stopped passing back one revolver apiece to be reloaded bang came a defiant shot from inside the stateroom the bullet struck the cabin floor just behind jack having passed between his feet the sailors back where they were comparatively safe from harm looked on in admiration at these two gritful young american officers pop 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 began the fuselage by jack and f again ouch came a sudden yell from the stateroom hit you did we called jack calmly well we're going to riddle you unless you stop that nonsense the answer was another shot from inside the stateroom the bullet clipped off a stray lock of hair at the left side of f summer's head both young officers fired slowly searchingly until their weapons were emptied then they passed the hot smoking revolvers back for new loads from the other side of the stateroom came no sound as soon as he and f had received the reloaded weapons jack motioned f summers not to fire for a few moments they listened then jack turned selecting the two most stalwart looking of the husky sailors back by the companionway a nod of jack's head brought them stealthily to his side put your shoulders to the stateroom door and force it commanded lieutenant benson at the same time jack and f moved up with the sailors holding their revolvers ready to fire at the first sign of renewed hostilities from within bump two pairs of sturdy shoulders went up against the door from within there came no sign of defiance bump at the second determined assault the door flew open step back men we'll go in first commanded lieutenant benson revolvers in hand and ready the two young officers of the sudbury pressed forward into the battered-looking room where is the rascal growled f summers here hiding like a cornered rat replied jack aiming both revolvers at a huddled figure well in under the lower berth come out gray you won't be hurt unless you try tricks on us the answer was a groan are you hurt inquired lieutenant benson yes how badly you hit me twice where once in the left arm and once in the right thigh oh, oh, oh. jack benson felt a slight twinge almost a guilty jerk of his conscience to be sure gray had been defying properly appointed officers of the government engaged in performing their sworn task gray had attempted to kill or injure the young officers still gray was a human being benson despite his fighting spirit at need was not fond of gazing upon misery i guess you can get you out with a little aid coaxed lieutenant jack gray's answer was another groan we'll help you out then jack continued but don't you dare to hope and fire on any of our party i would if i could snarled the wounded man why can't you fired my last cartridge snapped the wrench defiantly else you wouldn't have got in here without losing a few men 
Jack signed to the two men who had forced the door to lend a hand in moving Gray out from under the berth. As they got the wounded man out on the carpet, he presented a sad picture in his blood-stained clothing. "'Will the lieutenant pardon a suggestion?' spoke up one of the sailors, saluting. "'Yes. I have a first-aid package, sir. With some help I can bind this man's wounds until we get him over to the sick bay on the Sudbury.' "'A fine idea,' agreed Lieutenant Jack. "'Go ahead.' First of all, the wounded prisoner was taken out into the passageway. Jack and F. had yet important work to do here. For a few minutes they searched in vain. Then, in turning over the lower berth's mattress, F.'s hand touched something hard. "'Wait until I get my pocket-knife out,' he smiled. Rip. As Ensign F. tore open the mattress and thrust his hands inside, the grin on his face broadened. "'I reckon we've got the object of the whole expedition,' he announced. He drew out a package wrapped in heavy paper. Jack broke the string, unwrapping, and pulling out to the light a bundle of charts, layer upon layer. Yes, here we have what we're after, nodded Lieutenant Benson, and here are two books written chock full of notes to go with the charts. Gracious, that fellow. Millard must have stolen plans of every important fortified harbor on the Atlantic coast, and here are charts of some of the Gulf ports as well. Gray, his wounds bound, had been laid on the door of the stateroom, which had been taken from its hinges. On this stretcher, the prisoner was taken over the side into the launch. "'Who's going to pay for the damage done here, sir?' asked the skipper of the Cobtown schooner, stepping forward. "'Hm,' muttered Jack. "'It seems to me you are lucky, my man, that we don't put a prize crew aboard this craft.' and take you back to Norfolk. I haven't done anything, protested the fellow, except to stand for a lot of damage on board because you're backed by sailors and marines. My man, retorted Jack grimly, if you think you have suffered any unfair damage, then lay your case before the Navy Department. But my private advice is for you not to attract the attention of the authorities to you, in case they seem likely to overlook you. Is my vessel at liberty to proceed? inquired the man, sullenly. Yes, I have no orders to seize your craft. I'd like to, however, Lieutenant Jack Benson added dryly. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 of the Submarine Boys for the Flag. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. The Submarine Boys for the Flag by Victor G. Durham. Chapter 17 The Last Hour of Command. Through the night, the Sudbury rolled lazily over the waves. A wireless message had carried the news through space to Washington. Orders had come to return to Norfolk. They're turning gray over to the United States authorities. Benson and his comrades were instructed to return to Washington with the charts and record books. Down in the berth in the sick bay lay gray, a hospital steward, had made the wounded man as comfortable as possible. The latter was painfully but not seriously wounded. At the speed at which the gunboat was now proceeding, the Sudbury was due at Anchorage at six in the morning. Lieutenant Jack had turned in, after leaving orders that he was to be called a few minutes before five. He wanted to be on deck to enjoy the sensations of his last hour of command 
on the cruise of a vessel of the united states navy forward the sailors of the watch were talking in low tones of their very youthful officers there's real stuff in those boy officers mates grunted one sailor who'd been in the boarding party it don't make any difference whether they've been through annapolis or not look at the way the lieutenant and mr somers went up against the shooting kept us back and took the medicine themselves like real officers you'd expect it of somers rejoined another sailor there's a bit of the bull neck about him and such men always fight but the lieutenant makes a real officer that i'd be glad to follow anywhere mr hastings didn't get a chance to show what was in him suggested another of uncle sam's old salts oh you leave mr hastings alone for fighting if he saw any need to retorted the sailor who'd been the first to speak he's one of your very quiet chaps your quiet ones always sail into a fight while a brawler is getting his mouth wound up to do some talking hanged if i don't wish those lads could remain on board muttered another old salt with the young lieutenant to command the ship asked another him as well as anyone he knows what he's doing for which reason i don't care for the number of the year he was born in why mates the lieutenant is the head of them submarine boys we've read so much about in the newspapers when layin in port and the other two are his messmates now i'll stand for it that the submarine boys are good for any kind of a job on salt water i'd follow their lead on a battleship it would have been fine for the three submarine boys had they been able to know what great opinions the crew held of them but hal was again on the bridge in the last watch and f had gone below for an hour's sleep ere he like jack benson was to be called then at last two sleepy-eyed boys came from their cabins going up to the bridge for what they felt was their last hour of real sea glory ensign fullerton appeared half an hour before anchorage was made you have the satisfaction sir of knowing that your task was put through in record time said fullerton by way of congratulation for which i'm truly glad smiled benson yet i could wish our experience with the navy had not ended so soon why it hasn't ended yet sir smiled the executive officer it will in a few minutes more however sighed jack my last official act will be to order the gig into the water to take us on shore we're under orders to take the next train for washington you know very true smiled ensign fullerton but sir you are commanding officer of the sudbury no matter where you may be until you receive an order to relinquish command also sir your present appointments as officers in the service run until the orders appointing you are revoked but that will all happen before the day is much older replied jack with a forced smile it was going to come harder than he had thought after his brief taste of real naval life to give it all up no sooner had the sudbury let go her anchors than jack called for the gig he and his comrades hurried below doffing their uniforms which went back into the dress suitcases then in citizen dress with their precious swords again wrapped in chamois skin the three submarines went over the side there was the same ceremony however which had attended their coming aboard the marine guard turned out presenting arms as lieutenant jack benson passed to the side gangway ensign fullerton and mr drake stood by to salute jack and to receive his formal acknowledgment of their courtesy their feet touched the bottom of the gig they seated themselves and the short row to the landing stage commenced on the landing stage stood an orderly who promptly saluted the commandant's compliments to lieutenant benson and will the lieutenant and his comrades report to the commandant's office early as the hour was the commandant was at his desk in uniform and received the young officers most graciously mr benson and gentlemen declared the commandant of the navy yard you have done your work well and as quickly as it could have been done i congratulate you the secretary of the navy i believe will thank you personally 
it was splendidly done and now if you will come around to the officers club with me you will find that your breakfasts have been ordered it'll be an hour and a half yet before it'll be necessary for me to furnish you with a carriage that will convey you to the railway station in the presence of this much older officer the lads did not attempt to make merry at breakfast seated in the dining-room of the officers mess they listened respectfully to whatever the commandant saw fit to discuss the meal was about over when a marine orderly entered crossed the dining-room stopped at a respectful distance and saluted telegram sir the commandant received the envelope drawing out the sheet it contained lieutenant benson this will interest you and your comrades pursued the commandant the order revoking my command of the gunboat thought jack oddly enough though he expected it knew it must happen the arrival of the moment brought a strange sinking at heart i wonder how on earth it could have happened pursued the commandant his eyes again turned toward the paper millard has escaped from fort craven and so far has eluded recapture end of chapter seventeen recording by john brandon